Are you stressed? What is the physical and mental cost? Uh, well, let's talk about this and more in just a few moments on today's Wake Up With Hope episode. Stay tuned. Good morning and happy Friday, friends. Welcome to Wake Up With Hope. Are you ready for the weekend? Any special plans? Well, send us a message on our Wake Up With Hope Facebook page and fill us in. Did you know, friends, that today is National Pears Helene mm. Day? What is that? Well, it's about celebrating a food holiday, about a special French dessert that combines warm poached pears, vanilla ice cream, chocolate sauce, and crystallized violets or sliced mm. almonds. Oh, 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 that Yummy. sounds so good. I'll take a pair yeah. of those. <laughs> <laughs> or a pear too, like that. <laughs> well, you know, pears are rich in nutrients and several beneficial plant compounds. And it also promotes weight loss. Mm. But if they're eating like that, yeah, is that going to promote the chocolate weight sauce? Loss? We'll see. <laughs> well, maybe you know what? one. <laughs> Just remember this: it protects <laughs> against certain chronic conditions. That's right. And whichever way you enjoy those pears, we encourage you to make sure to take full advantage of the season and enjoy this amazing fruit that God has given. Mm, amen. You know, we hope our program today will be an encouragement to enjoy all the amazing things God has provided for us, including the abundant life that He has promised to those who place their hope in Him. So let's begin our day by diving in into what took place on this day in history. On this day in history in 1901, paintings by Vincent van Gogh were exhibited at the Bernheim Jeune Gallery in Paris, creating a sensation in the art world. Despite selling only one painting in his lifetime, Van Gogh's bold brushstrokes and expressive colors garnered acclaim posthumously. Despite facing numerous challenges and experiencing rejection during his lifetime, Van Gogh's artistic brilliance was recognized and celebrated after his passing. This serves as a powerful reminder that God can redeem even the most difficult situations for His glory. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, we are assured, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. You know, just as God worked through Van Gogh's struggles to bring about beauty and inspiration, He can also work through our own challenges to fulfill His purposes in our lives and bring about something beautiful. Mm, amen. Praise God for that. Well, it's now time for Health News with Dr. Narada McKibben. In the headlines today, gout flares cardiovascular risk, physical activity slows cognitive decline, and down on sleep, up on weight. Inflammation is an important risk factor for cardiovascular disease and gout is a common inflammatory condition that affects 4% of the US population. So researchers analyzed data in the Clinical Practice Research Data Link database of 15 million people in the UK and found that among people with gout, those who experienced a heart attack, stroke, or other cardiovascular event had a much higher odds of a recent gout flare in the preceding days. This suggests that having a flare of gout is associated with a temporary increase in the risk of cardiovascular events. So be sure to focus on a low inflammation, healthy diet for a few weeks after any flare of gout and perhaps stay on it long term. Researchers from the Russian Institute for Healthy Aging in the University of California have released a study finding physical activity slows cognitive decline. The study looked at neurofilament like protein levels, which are a marker of nerve fiber damage, and are used to monitor the progression of a wide range of neurological conditions, including Alzheimer's disease. The higher the levels, the more neurological damage. Researchers tracked levels over time in a group of 1,100 adults and found that those who began the study with high levels and were more physically active had slower rates of cognitive decline than those who were relatively inactive. 
Medium and high physical activity were associated with a 12% and 36% slower rate of cognitive decline respectively. Those who started the study with low levels of neurofilament like protein and medium physical activity had a 43% slower rate of cognitive decline. So to protect our brains, let's exercise regularly. The Journal of the American College of Cardiology recently published a study out of Mayo Clinic reporting results from an experiment aiming to clarify if sleep deprivation alone with no other environmental factors can trigger weight gain. 12 healthy non-obese people completed a 21-day stay as inpatients and included periods where they were limited to four hours sleep a night and other times when they were allowed nine hours sleep a night. The participants were repeatedly measured for calorie consumption, energy expenditure, weight, fat distribution, and circulating biomarkers. With only four hours of sleep a night, people ate more calories but did not increase their energy expenditure, resulting in weight gain and a substantial increase in abdominal fat. So next time you need to flatten your tummy, sleep well and be active. I'm Dr. Nerida McKibben, and that's today's health news. What can we learn from the mighty Banyan tree? Let's explore as Taj Pak Club takes us on an amazing adventure journey on today's Reflections of Hope episode. Of all the trees in the kingdom of the plants, there's one that stands out from all the rest. In some parts of the world, this tree is venerated, even worshipped as deity. In other parts of the world, it is seen as a natural jungle gym just waiting to be explored. It is the home of many birds, a shade for weary travelers, and a natural playground for the children of men. Of all the trees on God's green earth, the mighty banyan is definitely one of my favorites. Now there are several things that make this tree truly unique. The bold banyan begins its life by growing off of and deriving nutrients from another tree. This tree is called the host tree. The mighty banyan sends down roots from its branches all around the host tree. Over time, it completely overtakes the territory of the host tree and cuts off its supply of sunlight. It's like the banyan completely swallows up the host tree and the host tree forever becomes a part of the banyan. Once the roots of the banyan hit the soil and become well-grounded, it then grows into strong trunk-like structures that support the quickly extending branches of the banyan, thus enabling the branches to spread out far and wide. It looks like a large system of multiple interlocking trees, and yet it is only one singular tree. As I walked under the shade of the mighty banyan and climbed upon its sturdy branches, I couldn't help but think of the many spiritual lessons this tree teaches us. You see, the banyan is able to live because of the host tree that gave up its life. And just as the host tree died so that the banyan tree might live, so too there is one that died so that we might live forever. Jesus died on the tree of the cross so that we might have life everlasting. But the banyan tree takes away life only to give it back in rich fruit. So too we derive our life from our Creator that we might share it with those around us. And once we are rooted and grounded in Christ, we're then called to bear the fruit of the Spirit to the glory and the honor of His name. The unique root system of the banyan tree is also a reminder to us of the ultimate root, Jesus. The book of Revelation calls Him the root of David, the bright and morning star. Although the root is the most unsightly part of the plant, it is also the most powerful. It not only sustains life by bringing nutrients to the branches and leaves of the tree, but it also holds up the massive weight of the tree. Massive rocks and concrete slabs are torn apart by the noiseless power of the root. Hidden beneath the soil, its power is mighty. And so too, the power of the root of David, hidden in the heart, can break the strongest bands of sin. It is the root of David, Jesus Christ, that gives us life and holds us up as trees of righteousness. Like tree roots, he's not always seen or noticed, but surely he is there. And by the power of that divine root, we shall be able to withstand all the storms of the enemy. For the Bible says that the root of the righteous shall not be moved. So today I encourage you, 
Let Christ be the root and foundation of your life. And as you do, you will become a fruit-bearing shelter in this unsafe and starving world. A strong, solid, sturdy, and stable sanctuary of refuge for others. And with strong roots and sweet fruits, you will be just like Jesus, who sent his roots down from heaven to earth, that we might be forever connected, just like a heavenly banyan tree, to our wonderful God above. If you're enjoying today's show, share it with a friend or visit our website at hopetv.org slash wake up to see more. And search for us on YouTube to check out our YouTube channel and keep up with us there. We have to take a short break, but when we return, we'll be talking about stress and its impact. Stay with us. You know, we have all experienced stress, the good, kind and the bad. But what happens in our body when we are consistently stressed? What is the mental and physical cost of stress? Well, let's find out on today's episode of The Incredible Journey. Stress, it's something we all experience. It can come from conflict in our relationships, our health, our finances, our schools or workplace. It's all around us. And we all want to know what is the best way to deal with the stress in our lives. So we're going to ask a nutritional neuroscientist, Dr. Delia McCabe, how to deal with stress in our lives. Welcome Delia. Let's start with what is stress? Well look, there's good stress that gets us up in the morning, that keeps us motivated and working towards our goals. Otherwise we just stay in bed and do nothing. Bad stress, however, is the kind of stress that leaves us feeling overwhelmed. We feel like we can't cope with our lives. We feel like we don't have enough time. Things just feel overwhelming and really just push us down. That's the kind of stress that many people are experiencing today because we do live in a very complex and very challenging world. How does our brain deal with stress? Well, firstly, Gary, the stress response is only supposed to last for between 30 to 60 seconds because it was designed to get us away from a threat like a tiger very, very quickly. And look, in that space of time, the tiger either ate us and we didn't need the response anymore or otherwise we got away and we could relax again. So the brain is highly, highly tuned to pick up a threat, get glucose into our muscles so that we can either fight or run away. Unfortunately, the stress we're dealing with today is psychological. There's very seldom a physical threat like a tiger. So we've got the slow burn of adrenaline and cortisol, our stress hormones that bathe our neurons and continuously undermine us because it affects how we respond to the world from an emotional perspective. It drains our energy and we also need nutrients to be able to make all this adrenaline and cortisol, which undermines our health and stops us from feeling energ energetic and stops us from being able to fall asleep at night and feel calm and relaxed. How does stress affect what we eat? When people are stressed, they naturally gravitate to highly refined foods. Why? Because those kinds of foods give us a quick hit in energy and also allow the body to produce endogenous opioids which calm us down for a period of time. Not a long time, just a little bit of time. So people gravitate to those kinds of foods because it becomes a habitual response. What happens then? Then we've got blood glucose that's going up and down. That affects the brain because the brain needs a stable supply of energy. What happens as well? We feel less energy naturally. So we keep on going back to those kinds of foods and that affects our sleep. So there's this very negative vicious cycle that goes on when we feel stressed all the time. If we don't take hold of that stress, this vicious cycle continues and we end up with type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and ultimately dementias like Alzheimer's because the brain cannot cope with this ongoing bathing of these very toxic stress hormones. So what is the best way for us to deal with stress? One of the best ways is for people to be very, very clear about what their values are. You know, when we know what our values are, we're not trying to do a thousand things at once. We're only prioritizing those things that really matter. One of the challenges with today is that we are expected to, and we believe we have to do everything and be everything. It's not possible. So when we've got our values very clearly in our mind, we prioritize 
what really, really serves us, and we can forget about all the things we can't control, which is where a lot of stress comes from. Delia, you've shared some valuable information with us today. Thank you so very much. When we return, Pastor Mark Finley will be bringing us an inspiring message. Wake Up With Hope, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Wake Up With Hope. Thank you for making us part of your weekend. It's now time for a devotional thought. This morning, it will be brought to us by Pastor Mark Finley. We've been studying the book of Proverbs together. Proverbs is an amazing book of practical wisdom. In Proverbs chapter 17, in verse 17, the scripture says this, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. What is a friend? A real friend is one who walks in when the rest of the world walks out. That's according to Walter Winchell. Somebody else said a friend is someone who understands your past, believes in your future, and accepts you just as the way you are. Another person said growing apart doesn't change the fact that for a long time we grew side by side. Our roots will always be entangled, be tangled. I'm glad for that, according to Ali Kondi. You see, lots of people, according to Oprah Winfrey, want to ride with you in the limo. But what you want is someone who will take the bus with you when the limo breaks down. What is a friendship? What does the term friendship mean? What, who is a true friend? In a biblical sense, friendship is this deep personal relationship where you feel comfortable to share your joys, your sorrows, your strong points, and your weak points with the one that knows all about you but yet loves you still. The deepest relationship of friendship that we can possibly have is our relationship with Jesus. Throughout Scripture, the Bible talks about being friends with God. And the deeper our relationship is with Christ, the closer we feel to Him, the more we feel accepted, the more we can accept others. The more we feel forgiven, the more we can forgive others. The more we feel that Christ is our friend, the more we can reach out our hand in friendship. In John, the 15th chapter, the Bible talks about this concept of being friends with Christ. It's an amazing thing when you actually think about it, that Jesus, the one who existed from eternity, tabernacled in human flesh, the one that was one with the Father, and at whose very word name angels winged their way to worlds afar, the one at whose name angels obeyed, this Christ, the creator of the universe, the one that spoke and worlds came into existence, the one that spoke and earth was carpeted with living green, the one who spoke and sea and land and life appeared, the one that created Adam out of the dust of the earth. This Jesus wants to be your friend. I mean, it's an incredibly sublime thought. We read about it in John chapter 15, starting with verse 10, Jesus says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love, these things I've spoken to you, that your joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I've loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down his life for his friends. You're my friends if you do whatever I commanded you. No longer, no, don't miss this, this is significant. No longer will I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I heard from my Father I've made known to you. Jesus says, if I have loved you, love one another. And Jesus says, I loved you so much that I gave my life for you. You're not a speck of cosmic dust in the universe. You're not a grand zero. You're not like some soda can that has been run over by a truck and kicked 
to the side of the road, and little or no worth. You're not some pebble on the seashore. Jesus says, I created you and I fashioned you. And I want to have a relationship with you. I want you to be not simply a servant of mine, but I want you to be my friend. And when I understand that Christ invites me into an intimate, personal, loving relationship with him, when I understand that Jesus wants me to be his friend, it lifts my spirit, it encourages my heart, and it enables me to reach out in loving kindness and compassion and develop meaningful relationships with others. You know, I love that song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, All Our Sins and Griefs to Bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. The words of that song were written by Joseph M. Scriven. The story behind the song is quite remarkable. He was in his early 20s and he was engaged to be married. About a week or two before his wedding, by now, of course, the invitations had gone out. The pastor had secured the church facilities. They had planned the reception. But Joseph M. Scriven's fiance went swimming and unfortunately she drowned. It was a devastating experience to him. He left England and came to Canada. And there in Canada was so discouraged. He went out living in the forest, chopping wood, living in a little home, not on the edge of the forest. He'd often chop wood for elderly ladies. He said he'd never marry again. By the time he was in his 30s, he now found another woman that he loved deeply. They were engaged to be married, but unfortunately she developed a tragic lung disease and died a few months before the wedding. Joseph M. Scriven was so incredibly discouraged that he wondered if he could go on with life. Tears rolled down his face and he got a telegram in those days from England saying that his mother was dying. He didn't have enough money to go back to the funeral of his mom or to even see her before she died. And he decided that what he would do would write a poem. So he sat down one day and he began to write and these words came to his mind. What a friend we have in Jesus, written to his mother. Mother, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to, him in, to God in prayer. Have we trials or temptations, mother? Are there troubles anywhere? What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Joseph M. Scriven, in the trauma of his life, in the sorrow of his life, in the heartache of his life, in the disappointment of his life, when he was walking through those valleys, saw Jesus as his best friend. You may feel that you have very few friends, but Jesus reaches out to you today. He wants to be your friend. He wants you to have an intimate relationship with him. And the closer you draw to Jesus as you seek him in prayer, as you open his word and let him speak to you, the closer you draw to Jesus, the more your heart will be filled with his love to develop friends with other people. The more you trust Jesus, the more you can trust others in that friendship. Will you today enter into that precious relationship with Jesus? That is the basis of all friendships. Will you reach out to him today? He's reaching out to you. Thank you so much, Pastor Mark, for those encouraging words. Amen. Well, friends, we have come to the end of our program for today. Thank you so much for watching Wake Up With Hope. And if you'd like to learn more about us, please visit us at hopetv.org slash wake up. And you can also share hope with your friends. Again, the website is hopetv.org slash wake up. We pray you'll have a blessed weekend spent getting closer to Jesus. And don't forget to join us here on Monday morning. We will start the week with Voice of Prophecy sharing a morning devotional. And Gia and her mini chefs will be back in the kitchen making iced chocolate. Plus, we will have health news, so be sure to join us then. And if you enjoyed today's devotional thought, please visit hope.study for your free Bible study guides. We sincerely pray you have a wonderful weekend, friends, and may you feel the 
love and peace of God surrounding you. Amen. And before we go, we want to share with you a Bible promise. And today's promise is found in Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. It says, He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Mm, I love that version. Mm -hmm. All these things are gone forever. Can you imagine such a place, such mm -hmm. a world? No death, no sorrow, no tears, no mm -hmm. pain. Friends, I can't wait to be there. And this beautiful and amazing promise is for you. It's for me, it's for us. Mm -hmm. And as we follow Jesus, He is preparing a place for us in the glorious heavenly city. So cling to this promise today as you determine to walk with Him no matter what. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, today, Lord, we launch into a new day, not by ourselves, not alone, but Lord, come with us, abide with us. We want to hold on to your hand throughout this entire day as you lead us and guide us because we know that one day soon you will welcome us into your eternal kingdom so that we can abide with you forever. Thank you for these promises. Thank you for this hope. In Jesus' name, amen.